Amen. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. You know, just thinking about getting to this place. Um, man, how many of you guys remember 2019? <laughs> just think about 2019, the things that we were concerned about, the issues that we were encountering. Um, who knew uh, what was coming, what was going to happen at that point in time? And uh, just to be able to come together and worship on Easter, that would not have been a question. It's not an issue. And, you know, so I, 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 I'm so appreciative um, of being here. Uh, I talked about 2019. Of course, 2020 it seemed like the world turned upside down. How many of you guys personally, for you, if, if 2020... This past year was kind of rough, kind of rough, All right? And my hand is raised not to signal you to raise your hand. My hand is raised for myself as well. This past year was something else. Um, and rough for, for a number of reasons, right? It wasn't just the pandemic. It was so much the the unrest and the fighting. People lost friends that they had had for years. And it's just been rough economically, you know, and people who were solid in their careers and having to try and find a new way uh, to take care of their families. It was just rough. And there has been a mental toll that I believe is still carrying over from all of those issues. And so it's not just the environment. People had had to go to multiple funerals in the past year. And, you know, it's real easy when someone's in a, in a down place, in a rough place, you know, to tell them to have hope. You know, you need to have hope. And, and that things will get better. And, and it's easy to say that when you're not in the place where you need hope. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? If, if you haven't been to the funeral for your loved one, when you didn't lose your job, it's so much easier to tell the person who has gone to the funeral, who did lose their job, you need to have hope. And, you know, it's, we would think a person who follows Christ would be more resilient. Right? That a Christian ought to hope in a manner that maybe other people shouldn't have access to or ought to understand. And that's true, but again, it's easier said than done. But I think we would agree that hope can be very powerful. Right? Hope is something that you don't really think about until you really need it. And it can make a significant difference. I, I want to read something to you. This is from a psychiatrist. His name is Dr. Dale Archer. And he wrote this article called The Power of Hope in Psychology Today in 2013. Here's what he said. He says, if I could find a way to package and dispense hope, I would have a pill more powerful than any antidepressant on the market. He says, hope is often the only thing between man and the abyss. As long as a patient, individual, or victim has hope, they can recover from anything and everything. However, if they lose hope, unless you can help them get it back, all is lost. And this is a psychiatrist writing in Psychology Today. That hope is powerful. But man, if you lose hope, it truly is hopeless. There's nothing anyone can do. You can get that job, but if you don't have hope, you can have um, new things come into your life, but you'll miss it if you don't have hope. And so Christians sometimes find themselves in that place where they don't have hope. But I want to submit to you 
that when you get into a dark place, when I get into a dark place and I feel like I don't have hope, the reason I don't feel I don't have hope is because I have been looking for hope in the wrong place. And so today we're going to talk about finding hope in a place none of us would think we'd ever find hope. So for a few moments, I want to talk to you from this thought of hope from the grave. Hope from the grave. Um, If you have your Bibles or a Bible app, I want to uh, invite you to join me in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're just going to look at three verses, verses 3 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Let me give you a little context about this. So Peter is not writing to Christians who are just doing great. He's writing to followers of Christ in Asia Minor who are suffering. And they're suffering not just because of the environment, not just because of the economy, but specifically because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so they are being persecuted. They're being jailed. They're being disenfranchised because of their faith. So you can imagine they're at a low place. And Peter writes this letter, and he starts off telling them to praise God in this letter. Join with me in this this passage. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm going to tell you right up front the one thing I want you guys to remember today. One thing I want you to do is to praise God for a resurrection hope. I want that to be in your system. To praise God for a resurrection hope. Now, some of you probably, you know, when you saw the title of the message, probably thought, okay, I already know where he's going to go. Here's where he's going to go. He's going to talk about because Jesus rose from the dead, that he came out of the grave, then I should think, okay, because Jesus came out of the grave, God's going to get me out of my circumstance. He's going to get me out of this depressing place. And that's not where I'm going, right? Because that kind of makes the the resurrection just kind of allegorical. It's just a figurative thing that represents any time we get into trouble, and that's not true of the resurrection. Some of you thought, okay, because Jesus was resurrected, because he came out of the grave, then I know at least someday things will get better. That's absolutely true. But I want you to have a more informed understanding about that better day. See, what this passage talks about is that in the resurrection, the thing that we celebrate today, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, he's your Lord. What this says is that you became a new creature through the process of his resurrection. Remember reading that in the passage. It says, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Y'all remember reading that in the passage? And so some of you have heard that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. Maybe you've heard the phrase of being born again. Absolutely true. When you believed, you were born again. But this lets us know that the birth canal for your new self was through the grave of of Christ Jesus. That it was through his resurrection that we can experience this new life. See, with your faith, you're joined with Jesus Christ. You're united with Jesus Christ in his death as well as in his resurrection. And so if I'm united with Jesus in his death, that means I died to what he died to. And if I'm united with him in his resurrection, that means I am alive to what he's alive to. Y'all follow me? 
And so that means the power of sin, I'm actually dead to the power of sin because Jesus died to sin once and for all. But when he was resurrected, he was resurrected to a new life before God. And so now I walk in the newness of life, according to Romans chapter 6, because of my union with Jesus. And, and so that is something to praise God about, right? The fact that my old self was crucified with Jesus Christ. That old person, those values and the effect of those actions have been buried. But now, united with Christ, I can walk in the newness of life with Jesus Christ. So, so, so I am resurrected with Jesus. That, that's, that's getting me to where I want to talk about, but that's actually not where I want you to go. I want you to see that you're not just resurrected, you're resurrected to something. Go back to our focal passage. Verse 3, it says, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Y'all see that? That you're resurrected to a living hope. Now, like I said earlier, when we're in dark places, we think, okay, I ought to have hope. I'm talking about children of God followers of Jesus Christ, people who read their Bibles and pray to God, ought to have a hope. And we'll think Christians ought to hope. They're also, that is absolutely correct. But there's a such thing as a Christian hope. There is a hope that only resurrected people have. And so if I have that hope, I have the power of that hope, no matter what situation that I'm in, right? Because see, if I don't have that hope, if I have hope and, you know, things will get better, maybe that person that went out of my life will come back into my life. Maybe things will change about my health. If, I, if my hope is in those temporal things, that's not a hope I was resurrected to. And so it might happen and it might not happen. And so if it doesn't happen, then I start to lose hope. But if I understand the hope that I have been resurrected to, it's a hope you can't lose, right? Because he puts a modifier on that hope. He didn't just say resurrected to hope, right? Because that's resurrected hope. I got up and I just hope things ought to go good today. No, he said to a living hope. What does he mean by living hope? He's talking about it being active. That is not stagnant that it is something that is vibrant and life-giving. A living hope is what you have been resurrected to. Now, now what in the world is, the, is this living hope, right? If, if there's a particular Christian hope, what is it? Well, he helps us to understand it with the next verse. So in the next verse, verse 4, he says, to an inheritance. Do y'all see that? He's actually telling you what the living hope is. The living hope is an inheritance. It is something that you will receive in the future. It is something that exists somewhere that is for you that you will take hold of in the future. And he says this inheritance is our living hope. So the living hope is the same thing as the inheritance. And so what does he mean about inheritance? Because sometimes you read about um, us having an inheritance. If you're a child of God, when you were indwelt with the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to talk. I want you to read this. I want you to read this. Um, look at Ephesians, let's see, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Did y'all hear that? Now, if it wasn't in your notes, put it in your notes. 
Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, In him, in him is Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, meaning the good news of Jesus Christ, when somebody shared the gospel with you, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. You've heard about us being adopted into God's family, of us becoming children of God. Look at what Romans 8 says, verse 16. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What is he talking about that suffer with him? Being buried to what he was buried for, dying with Jesus to what he died to, and being resurrected, glorified to what he was resurrected to. That when you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you became an heir. And what is the inheritance? The inheritance is everything God has promised believers that they would have. Right? That's the whole new life, the new heavens and the new earth. That's the whole new bodies. That's the streets of gold. That's the being with God face to face. That's the existence apart from sin. No sin, no temptation, right? It's the Garden of Eden without the tempter or the temptation. is your inheritance, right? Because when we think about hope, we think of this maybe thing. You know, I got a hope. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if I'll ever take hold of it or if it'll ever come true, right? It's, it's wishing upon a star. It's, it's seeing a fallen star kind of thing when we think of hope. But a Christian hope, a living hope, is an inheritance, and so I am an heir. Now, what I love about this passage is that it tells us some things about that inheritance that ought to just make you want to praise God. Right? It's three things that we see in this passage that ought to just make you want to praise God that talks about our inheritance. The first, he talks about the quality of the inheritance. The quality. How does he describe it? He says that it is imperishable. Y'all remember reading that? That it is imperishable. That it cannot be destroyed. It will never go away. And he's speaking of it being eternal. Right? Let me tell you why that's so significant, right? Because the stuff that we get hopeless about are perishable things. And if we continue to put our hope in perishable stuff, we will continue to lose hope. But the hope we have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is imperishable, right? That's why the Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why, why is that important? Because if flesh and blood could, could inherit the kingdom of God and the inheritance is imperishable and I'm still perishable, I would have a good time, but I wouldn't have a good time for long. He says that my, your inheritance does not have an expiration date. Right? Everything in your house has an expiration date. When you go to the store, you, I know when I'm looking at produce and when I'm looking at meat, y'all got some ribs I'm doing today. Okay, just FYI. <laughs> I look at the date. When I buy milk, right? Now, usually we, we go through milk pretty quickly, but I don't get that milk that's on the front of the shelf. I'm just telling y'all what I do. I move all that milk away. Sometimes I got to tiptoe and reach all the way to the back and get that milk. Now, what's the difference between the milk, right? What's on the front is a date 
closer to its expiration. Because the store wants to move that material, that, that produce or that item before it spoils. So they got it in the front. But the newer milk, the milk that will last longer, is at the back of the shelf. And so I don't know when we're going to drink all that milk. And the last thing I want is to have milk I pay for that we can't drink. So I get the milk that's less likely to perish while it's in my possession. And so what God says about your inheritance, he says, if it's milk that I give you, you don't have to worry about it perishing in your possession, right? Because a part of your inheritance is having an inheritance that cannot perish, but also makes you an heir that won't perish from the inheritance. Man, I need y'all to digest that for a moment. That's enough to praise God for. That if he promised it to you, that promise can't be broken. But he didn't just stop at describing it as imperishable, right? He, he, he gives another description. He says that it's undefiled. Y'all remember reading that? That it's undefiled. What in the world does it mean undefiled? Biblically, it's a theological thing that you see. When something is defiled, it means that it's been tainted by sin. Right? So when, when the Bible talks about something being defiled, it's because sin has happened in connection with it. And so it becomes spiritually unclean. So it's something God can't even work with because it's tainted by sin. And what it describes and tells us about this inheritance is that in essence, it can't be messed up. Right? Right? First of all, it's in heaven. So we wouldn't think there'd be anything in heaven that could taint the inheritance. Does that make sense? Right? We would just think that just makes sense. Why does he have to say that it's undefiled if it's in a place where no one there can sin and mess it up. Well, he's not talking about anyone messing it up in that place. Y'all not getting it. I'm, 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 I'm going to get you there. Have you ever, I'm, before I get there, have you ever recognized when you made a wrong choice, right? Where you have sinned. You recognized and thought to yourself, I wonder what blessing I'm missing because of this sin. Anybody ever thought that way before? You know, just wonder and say, oh, man, things were going so good. And because I have misstepped, I'm wondering if I've lost something. Sometimes you don't have to wonder, right, in regards to a relationship, a faithful, loving relationship, and you act unfaithful, unloving, and that relationship goes south, then guess what? You don't have to wonder if your sin impacted that relationship, same thing on a job place. You got a job you love, but you do something wrong, something you had a choice in doing, and you lose it. Right there, man, sin impacted what I had. Now, here's the thing, what this text tells us. Because the inheritance is undefiled, it's telling you and I that my sin can't touch it. I need y'all to get that. Right? There's already nothing there that's sinful that can touch it. But because it's undefiled, it's even kept from my own sin. So I can't lose what God has promised. When people say, well, wait a minute, I thought we had rewards. Rewards are in addition to what God has promised. Right? The parable of the talents, all of those who served faithfully got the well done, good and faithful servant. They were getting an increase in their authority and they had to invite in sharing in the master's happiness. Not all of them, for just being faithful, get the benefit and the blessing of coming and sharing in the master's happiness. But the ones who were more productive in their faith got greater authority. That's the reward. So you can get more for being faithful, but you can never get less for being unfaithful. Oh. God, that, that, that oh, made me praise God. Made me 
Praise God. There, there was a little boy in, in uh, I think it was Taiwan, uh, went to the museum. I think it was in 2015. And he had a misstep. And when he tripped, he caught himself on the wall, right? Problem was, there was a painting on the wall. And, you know, he got his balance back. But when he looked, he put a hole through the wall. That picture was worth $1.5 million. Can you imagine being the parent of that little boy? <laughs> Wasn't on purpose. Accidental. But his misstep impacted something of value. And they were talking on the news store, you know, the museum was going to look at its policy of how it displays art. And they interviewed a person on the street to ask them what they might do. And the person said, why don't they put some glass up? Protect it. <laughs> Right? $1.5 billion and it's just out where people can touch it? It has no protection? But it's not true when it comes to your inheritance. Your inheritance is far more valuable than that pain. But none of your missteps can impact it. It's undefiled. And then he says it's unfading. Y'all remember that? Right? That means it never loses its beauty, its luster. Whatever makes it magnificent, it stays that way. I remember growing up and, you know, just understanding. We would talk about heaven. And, you know, I would hear the preacher talk about we're going to worship God all day, every day. And the people would say amen. And I'm like, every day? All day. Right? We have a hard enough time coming now. Right? And sometimes, especially, you know, if you grew up in old school church, it seemed like they was waiting on something to happen that nobody knew about in the worship service. Because it seemed like the songs kept going on and on. And I used, you know, my theory was the preacher or whoever wanted somebody to start shouting because then that would bring the worship to an end. But no, when people start shouting, it kept going. You go to church at 11 and it's 1.30. And so 11 to 1.30 felt long. And the preacher's saying, heaven is all day. <laughs> Every day. Now, y'all, let me tell y'all one of my favorite foods that I can't eat as much as I would like are pancakes. I love pancakes. Right? I didn't have pancakes for dinner. I really can. It's not an issue. There's no clock here. <laughs> here, here. There's no clock that says, oh, no, it's after 12. Okay. Love pancakes, but I can't have pancakes. But if I could have them every day, I've had them when I was a kid. I had these little microwave pancakes from Swanson, little sausage links. I ate those five days a week. But you know what? Eventually it gets old. Right? A good thing can get old, but not our inheritance. He says, the experience of what I have promised to you, what you will receive, never gets old. If worship is included in that, it never goes to a low point. You never get to a place like and wonder, when will I sit down? You stay at a place saying, how can I not stand up? Because it's so good. That the whole experience, you never get tired of walking those streets of gold. That, that the fruit from the tree of life never gets bland. It is always exciting, enjoyable, 
it is always in this utmost place of our experience because it's unfading. You know, earlier I talked about in museums these famous paintings that are, that, are, that are there. They're worth so much money. But you know what the museum has to do from time to time? They have to restore those paintings. You see, because just time, the environment, the colors start to dull. The features are no longer distinct. And so they have to pay a conservator to go in and meticulously, meticulously touch up that painting to restore the color, the distinctiveness. And they have to do that over and over again because it fades. But your inheritance never needs touching up. Never needs restoring. And so the quality of our inheritance is something to praise God for. But here's a second reason to praise God about this inheritance is its security. Right? It's security. Where is it kept? Y'all remember reading where it was kept? In heaven. It is kept in heaven for you, verse 4, right? You think about the most secure place on earth. One of the, arguably one of the most secure places on earth is Fort Knox. Anybody heard of Fort Knox? Right, where it's like half of the U.S. deposit of gold is at Fort Knox. And so not only are there, there are fence around that, that there's these, this vault that's, I want to say, 20 feet of steel. And the people who can go in that vault, no one single person has the combination to go in. That a portion of the combination is dispersed between different people, and they don't know the other person's combo. And so if you could get through the fence, you'd have a hard time trying to get the vault open. But even if you might have a maze to try to get everybody together to try to get them to open the vault, it's in connection with an army bag with 40,000 soldiers. So I can get through a fence, but I can't get through all of that, right? And that's the most secure place on earth, but it don't compare to the security of heaven, right? Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, listen, don't store up your treasures here on earth. Right? And, and, he, and he tells us why, right? Where, where, where thieves break in and steal, where moth and rust destroy, right? You can have something that people can't get to and still lose it right where you put it. But he said, instead, store up your treasures in heaven where thieves cannot break in and steal. And moth and rust can't destroy the most secure place in the universe is in heaven. Right? So the things of value, if I could put them in heaven, that's where I would put them. And that's where God says your inheritance is stored. Right? And it has your name on it, like a safety deposit box that only you can get access to. It is kept in heaven for you. And so it is secure. But it actually gets better than that. I want y'all to look at verse 5. Remember our, uh, verse 5? I'm going to start at verse 4, right? Kept in heaven for you. And then verse 5, it says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation. Do y'all remember reading that? Do you see that? I need you to process that part now. Who's the who that's being guarded? Who's the who? The who is you. The who is you. What in the world does that mean? What that means is you become an heir through your faith. And so God, God guards your inheritance. But he doesn't just guard your inheritance for you. He guards you for your inheritance. I don't know if I can say it right. Right? 
Can I ever disqualify myself? Can the devil ever do anything to say I can't get what God wants me to have? Because the Bible says that God's power protects me. Right? He keeps my inheritance and he keeps the heir for the inheritance. Fort Knox protects the gold for the nation, but it can't protect the nation for the gold. But God can do both for you and I. That I am keeping your promise and I am keeping you for the promise. That's enough for me to praise God. But we got one more, y'all. One more. We, we, we talked about the quality of the inheritance. We talked about the... The, 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 the security of the inheritance, the last thing I want you to be able to praise God about, no matter what you are, where you are in what situation, is the absolute certainty of the inheritance. That it's not a might happen. It's going to happen. Right? Because he says, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So now understand, when he talks about salvation, he's not just talking about you being uh, going by the judgment of Jesus Christ and getting through that judgment with no penalty for your sin. He's talking about the whole experience of what you've been saved to, right? So that living hope is the same thing as the inheritance is the same thing as the salvation. And so you are being saved to something, right? This inheritance that's living. That nothing can take away, nothing can destroy, you can't be taken away with. But he says, guess what? It's on a clock. I, God doesn't have to go do anything. You know, sometimes people come by your house and you're not ready, right? And, you know, dinner's not ready, you're not finished cleaning, right? And you're trying to put them somewhere and finish everything, entertain them. But no, he says when it comes to your inheritance, it's ready. It's just waiting on a time. It, it, it's not a might happen. It is literally on the clock. I know, no, okay, well, how does that encourage me? Because I don't know when it's going to happen, right? People have been waiting for Jesus to return since when? 2,000 years almost, right? So I, I might be another 2,000 years. When will I get to experience my, my inheritance? You don't have to wait that long, ladies and gentlemen. Right? That is the time in which everybody experiences. But people are already experiencing the blessing of that living hope. Right? The Bible tells us in Psalm 90.10, our time frame is 70 years, 80 if we have strength. And so if it's not the time, I know that I have my time to experience that blessing right 70 80 years do the math right subtract right and when it seems that sounds morbid pastor i wasn't thinking about my mortality like that right i'm 49 that's saying i got what 31 years left right that's 2052 make it real <laughs> right do the math what, what year is it Right? And it sounds morbid because we're thinking about what we're leaving and what I'm losing. Oh, you know, I only got that much amount of time to enjoy life, to spend time with people, and it's backwards for the Christian. Because that means I got 31 years to wait for me to experience life, for me to be with loved ones. And so I'm on a clock, right? And I'm not getting depressed. The closer I get to, I ought to be getting more excited. All right? Y'all, let me tell y'all something about my wife. She's over there, Tracy Clemens. Let me tell y'all something. This has been her since I've known her. Her mood increases the closer we get to the weekend. She, she know I'm telling the truth. Right? It's not that she's a negative person or anything. But her joy increases the closer we get to Friday. Living for the weekend. Living for the weekend right? Now, y'all, she has a job now. Thank God that she likes. She enjoys it. So it's not like being depressed and I can't stand going to work. But work isn't the same as not going to work. Y'all follow what I'm saying? 
And so as she gets Wednesday, she starts talking about the weekend. You know what she calls Thursday? Friday Eve. <laughs> she will stay up late at night on Thursday as if it is Friday because she knows she can make up for it on Friday. And I always know when it's about between 4.20 and 4.30 on Friday, without fail, this phone is going to ring. And I'm going to hear this crazy person doing all sorts of stuff on the end of the phone every Friday. She might be singing. She might, there's no telling what she's going to say. Because she is that close to the weekend. Can you imagine how she's going to be when she gets close to retire? Oh, my goodness. I may have to call the hospital or something. We may have to get something, some kind of medication. Y'all just don't know. But here's my point. If she can be joyful as she approaches the weekend, when she can approach this time of freedom to do and to celebrate the things that she has worked for, how much more are we to celebrate as we get closer to our inheritance? <laughs> as we get closer to no longer having to deal with the troubles of life, the difficulties of life, the pains of life, but also this time of enjoying the promises of God. When I was, uh, I want to say I was around 12 or 13, uh, this organization contacted my dad. And matter of fact, he contacted my dad and all his siblings. And it was because we had an uncle we didn't even know about who had passed away. And he had left an estate. And so the company would give you the information, but you had to sign over a portion of the estate to get the inheritance, right? And so, you know, we had no idea, you know, it's not like, you know, you, you see those things in the email, you know, about the rich uncle over in Africa. Don't, listen, please don't answer those, by the way, if you're watching. But this was real. He wasn't in Africa, he was in San Francisco. And so the siblings signed this document, I want to say all but one. And they received um, money. And the organization kept the third. That was the deal, right? And wouldn't you have wanted to get all the inheritance? And it seemed wrong, but it's legit that you didn't know about the inheritance, so you couldn't claim the inheritance without the information? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we just read about your inheritance. And it is no charge. And so you're going to get all of your inheritance when you have trusted your life to Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. That's the thing you got to sign today to have your inheritance because he didn't keep any for himself. It's all for you. Do you want to sign on and become an heir? Listen, if you're watching, if you're here today, if you're watching, and uh, Jesus has been this kind of information thing, church may have been a habit or a routine, but Jesus had not been genuinely your Lord and Savior, the one whom you have surrendered your life to, the one whom you now live for, because he died for you and for your sins. If you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do that right now. I want to invite you to do that because we just read when you do that, there's a new kind of hope you have. You have a living hope that came from the grave of Christ out of that empty tomb. He brought us. And he didn't just bring us from something, he brought us to something. And I, he wants you to have it. And I want you to have it. And the question is, do you want to have it? Listen, if you do, I want to invite you to pray uh, with me. Uh, 
just saying this prayer. Father God, I know that you love me, but I haven't always loved you. And I know that I am a sinner, that I have done things and said things that were against your law and didn't reflect your character. But I thank you for love and for grace that would send your only begotten son, Jesus, to not just live before me, but to die for me and to live again so that I could live with him. And so I put my trust in Jesus. I surrender my life to him and I want to live for him. Thank you for saving me and making me an heir. in Jesus that I pray this prayer. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, we would love to know about it. Earlier, we talked about that connect um, and connecting with us. You can use that same means to let us know where you are. Maybe you prayed that prayer. Maybe you want information about being baptized or connecting with the Way of Life Church as family. Let us know. And it'd be our joy to walk with you. Listen, my prayer for all of us is that we all recognize that we have hope. That no matter what will happen in 2021, doesn't mean it won't impact us emotionally, but it'll never take us to the place where we don't have hope. Our hope is living. It is preserved. It is imperishable. It can never be defiled and it'll never fade away. And so, listen, I hope that blessed you. If it blessed you, listen, share it with somebody else and bless them. All right? I want, I want to thank everyone for making uh, the sacrifice and being here today. I want to thank you for being here in your prayers. And Lord willing, uh, we'll see you next week to worship God all over again. Amen?